Um, today we need to finish our discussion of T cells in the periphery and then move into thinking about B cell responses in the periphery. Um, so we've seen all of these steps of T cell actions in the periphery and we left off last time talking about um, CD4 helper cells and the fact that they can differentiate into different subsets based on which cytokines they receive to polarize them, um, which transcription factor they eventually turn on, and the effector cytokines that they then make. And we can also see that um, these different cell types have roles um, in combating different types of infections, which are described here. Um, this also talks about how they might be related to different disease states. Um, some of these are really clear, like the TH2 relationship to allergy. Some of these are a little bit more vague, which is why I didn't go into them in quite much detail in class. And so we saw um, TH17 cells last time. We saw TH2 cells last time. We saw T follicular helper cells last time. And we saw TH1 cells. Um, so you can ignore the TH9 and the TH22 that are on here. Um, one of the other things that we talked about that is really important that I want to make sure to hit again is that these different cell types have sort of positive feedback loops where once we start making one of these types of cells, we can actually sort of uh, enhance the production of more of that subtype of cells. But we also can see negative feedback inhibiting some of the other cell types. Originally, um, when people talked about CD4 helper subsets, they talked about TH1 and TH2. And it was shown that TH1 polarizing factors not only induce TH1 polarization, they actively inhibit TH2 polarization. And the same was true of a TH2 factor. It will turn on TH2 polarization and inhibit TH1 polarization. And so this feedback between these responses is also incredibly important. We left off last time talking about sort of the last group of helper T cell subsets that I wanted to tell you about. Um, and these cells are known now as regulatory T cells or T regs. Regulatory T cells um, can be polarized um, in the periphery by having a naive C4 T cell receive the cytokine TGF beta. Um, that will make the cell turn on a transcription factor called FOXP3. Um, and when FOXP3 is activated, that cell will begin to make IL-10 and TGF beta. The function of these cells is that they are going to be able to turn off other immune cells. So they are going to regulate those other immune cell types. Um, you can see that listed here as suppression. Um, and as I um, mentioned to you guys last time, um, there was this whole literature, uh, I think it was in the 80s, of suppressor T cells. Suppressor T cells were <coughs> great. Suppressor T cells were sort of the thing for autoimmunity, <coughs> the thing for all sorts of other things. Everybody loved suppressor T cells. Um, they did some genetic mapping studies, and so the suppressor T cells were linked to this special MHC plus 2 molecule called IJ. So we talked about IA in our week. Um, and then they sequenced the mouse chromosome, and there was no IJ. There was no, no gene where they thought there would be a gene. And so everyone was like, shh, suppressor T cells, I never believed that stuff. That's, that, that, that was a lie. Me? No, 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 I never thought that. And sort of the idea of the use of the word suppressor was like the, a dirty word. Um, and as a result, the bar for proving that regulatory T cells existed was really, 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 really high. Um, there are many immunologists who think that the people who finally did this work, um, a guy named Shiro Sakaguchi and another guy named Ethan Shiba, um, will at some point win the Nobel Prize for this work. Um, and one of the things that Sakaguchi did is that he um, was looking for 
CD markers or proteins that were on the surface of these cells that he kind of thought were regulatory B cells. And it's sort of weird to read his, this paper he wrote because it feels like he just randomly is like, well, what about this one? And you kind of are like, yeah, I bet in, in reality you went to the table and you tried all of them. And this was the one you got to. Lucky for you, it was 25. And you only had to try 24. <laughs> it wasn't 379. Um, because it's sort of like, hey, look, these cells seem to have a lot of CD25. Um, CD25 is a pretty important protein. You saw it in T cell development. Um, but you've also seen it in another situation, and I didn't call it CD25 at that point. CD25 is the IL-2 receptor alpha, the high affinity IL-2 receptor, or the chain that makes the high affinity IL-2 receptor. Um, and this kept the regulatory T cell field um, in a state of confusion for a long time, because when you activate a T cell, it starts making IL-2 receptor alpha. And so people were like, great, I found a T cell. It's either activated or regulatory. So it's either really active or really not active. Perfect. I, I, I've narrowed it down. And it's like, yeah, those are like all the options. Um, and so for a long time, the only thing we had was the ability to say, well, they have C25, but they're not activated, and so you could do, people would do like super complicated flow cytometry to find unactivated CD25, and it, it was a whole fiasco. And so some people were still like, yeah, I don't think these cells exist. You're, you're, you're being too crazy. Um, however, when this transcription factor, FOXP3, was finally described, um, and it was able to really differentiate this type of cell, um, people really started to um, understand and believe the regulatory T cell field, and the regulatory T cell field had the tools that needed to move forward, um, which really allowed um, all of this to come forward. Um, and so as a result, um, we do now know that regulatory T cells are able to, um, here it shows that they can suppress the action of CD4 T cells, you could also imagine them turning off CD8s. You can imagine them turning off B cells. You can imagine them turning off you know, different presenting cells. You can sort of imagine that suppression um, being for a lot of cell types. There is still quite a bit that's unknown about what goes on with the regulatory T cell. We know that some of that regulation is due to the cytokine production, like IL-10, which is a pretty suppressive cytokine. Um, some experiments say that this, the regulatory T cell has to be able to touch the other cell. Some say that there's a contact dependence, and so that would make it sound like there's a protein on the surface that's turning off the other cell, but nobody really knows what that is. Um, so there's still quite a bit to sort of figure out in terms of what's going on with those regulatory T cells. Um, we do know that they can sometimes um, uh, make those inhibitory cytokines to inhibit other cells, either the T cells or the antigen presenting cells. Um, or they, because they have so much CD25, they can also soak up all the IL-2 and deprive other cells of IL-2, basically by acting as an IL-2 sink. Um, and so regulatory T cells um, were um, and still are thought to be incredibly important in many immune-mediated diseases. You could imagine if you did not have regulatory T cells, that you might end up with um, autoimmune issues. And in fact, um, I am realizing now, though I don't know why I did, did this, um, that there actually is an autoimmune disease that happens when people have a mutation in FOXP3. And I have slides and they're not in this. I, they're in, my, they're in the uh, autoimmunity day and not this one. Um, but there is actually a, an autoimmune disease. Um, it was part of how FOXP3 was discovered um, there is something called IPEX, um, or immune poly polyendocrinopathy X-linked. Um, again, uh, FOXP3 turns out to be on the X chromosome, and so largely you see this in boys, um, where there were boys who were coming down with multiple organ autoimmune diseases, um, and it was because they had no FOXP3 and could make these other cells. Um, and you can imagine other types of sort of issues with regulatory T cells being really important in many types of 
inflammatory, autoimmune, blah, 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 blah. Um, what I have told you about was sort of some of the early stuff that people realized about regulatory T cells. And in fact, at that point, they were still calling them TH3s. But they stopped that because they realized something else about regulatory T cells. Eventually, they realized that there are two ways you can make regulatory T cells. The way that I've just, just described to you is one of the ways you make regulatory T cells. Um, but there is, in fact, a second way that is also really important. So if you recall, we talked about um, the Goldilocks model of T cell development in the thymus. We had a developing T cell. And if the developing T cell got no signal, what happened to it? What? It dies. It dies of neglect. It's sad. No signal. If it gets a very high signal, what happens? Dies. Why does it die this time? Probably self-reactive. It gets actively killed. It's negatively selected. What if the cell gets a sort of lowish signal? You get positive selection. The cell lives. So all of those cells are partially self-reactive. That's true for cells that have kind of low affinity. Sometimes we talk about low medium versus high medium. So these, these are the low mediums, or the low as opposed to nothing. But you can also imagine there's a little bit of a gray area. What if you're, you're kind of on the high side, Maybe you, you could be negatively selective, but maybe you could be positively selective. Like, where's the specific cutoff between high and low? And it turns out, in reality, there's not a specific cutoff. There's actually a fourth category, which is sort of high intermediate or medium high. If you imagine those cells that are medium high are a little on the risky side. They could be kind of self-reactive. They could be involved in self-reactivity, but they also could be really useful in terms of being cross-reactive. Those cells are induced in the thymus to develop into regulatory T cells. And so we also have regulatory T cells that turn into regulatory T cells not because of cytokines they received in the periphery, but because of the strength of signal they received in the thymus. And so this is sort of the real version of the figure that I showed you before. Um, so very high signal is going to lead to negative selection and deletion, um, but sort of slightly less high, sort of moderately high signal will push those cells into Treg development. And so again, we're getting rid of the danger because they're not going to be active and be able to um, make a response that could kill cell tissues. And in fact, if we start to see responses to cell tissues, they might be the ones who participate and they can shut it down. Um, and so we're getting rid of these potentially slightly dangerous cells by pushing them into the t red path. These cells still, when they get this signal in the thymus, they turn on FOXP3. So it's the same transcription factor. When they turn on FOXP3, they make IL-10 and TBF beta. They make the same cytokines. So the cells after the fact look the same. This t red and a Treg that was induced by cytokines in the periphery, well, you won't be able to tell the difference um, when you see those cells in the periphery. Um, but there are two different ways they could have been induced or could have been developed to become regulatory T cells. Um, but like I said, otherwise these regulatory T cells look identical to the other ones. It's part of the reason why at some point somebody just said, because that sometimes we were talking TH3, and so people were very confused, and so it was also like, just let's throw out the name and call them all Tregs and be done. Um, because they all are really doing the same thing and playing the same role. Um, in some um, of the experiments, particularly the Sakaguchi experiment, where they did a lot of the description of, uh, some of the early descriptions of Tregs, they were using mice that didn't have a thymus, and so they were probably mostly looking at Tregs coming out of the thymus. Um, and one of the things that is sort of interesting to think about is that um, there may be changes as people age in terms of what percent of cells are active T cells and what percent are T regs that are coming out of the thymus. Um, there are some diseases that do seem to be treated by thymectomy. 
and it may be a matter of percentages of those two cell types coming out of the thymus. Um, the other big thing that I want to uh, point out is if we think about feedback between our helper T cell subsets, it's not just the Th1, Th2 thing. As we have described more helper T cell subsets, we have realized that the feedback is between all of the subtypes and not just Th1 and Th2. So each of these subtypes, what you can see, each Th2 can turn off T red. I'm sorry, this is the Th1. Th2 can turn off T17. Th, this is confusing. <laughs> but in the end, all the, all the kinds can turn off all the other ones. <laughs> um, Wait, can Th2 turn off T reds? Um, can Th2 turn off T reds? Because it looks like Th1 and Th2 can't turn off T reds, so T reds can turn off Th2 and Th2. So, it's a little bit controversial to be honest with you. Um, so, for example, um, and particularly a place where that controversy comes in is with Treg versus T17. Um, because if you have a naive T cell and that T cell gets TGF beta, it becomes a Treg. But if that cell gets TGF beta plus IL6, then it becomes an IL7 or T17. And so you could see situations where maybe there's IL-6 being produced inappropriately, where suddenly you're not getting the T-red production you're supposed to get. Those cells get pushed in the wrong direction instead. So especially the T-red T-17, um, we think that there's a little bit more feedback. This figure, you're correct, doesn't, um, this figure doesn't say that, um, T that that level of interaction can happen, but it's also making TGF beta and IL-10 come out of TH2, which is why that can be useful here. Um, so, um, in general, you can think about all of the types repressing one another. Um, and just so you know, your textbook has a handy dandy table of all of the helper T cell subsets that we've learned, specifically listing the polarizing cytokine, the mastery regulator, the effector cytokines, and the functions. So if you were going to try to remember those, let's look at this table. And again, you don't need to know about TH22 or TH9. Um, and similarly, your textbook was also really helpful and made a picture too. So there's also a picture of the same information for you. Um, again, you don't need to know TH22s or TH9s, but this is sort of general stuff that you should know. Um, so we've been talking about T cell action in the periphery now. Um, for the past few days. And realize that all of this is sort of a continuation of our story of T cell development. So originally we had some type of hematopoietic stem cell um, that developed in the bone marrow that may have traveled to the thymus to undergo T cell development. After that T cell finished development, it, may, it will have traveled to some sort of secondary lymphoid organ where it could have found antigen and done all of the responses that we're talking about. Previously on immunology lecture, <laughs> um, we saw B cells that were doing their development in the bone marrow. However, when those B cells finished their development in the bone marrow, we said, and then they go to the periphery. And we didn't follow through with the functions of those B cells in the um, and so now we're going to actually be going through that same part of this process where we see what happens to those B cells in the periphery and look at those B cell responses. Um, and so again, this is looking at B cell effector function. Um, so this is all after the maturation of those B cells in the bone marrow um, in terms of everything we're going to be talking about now. No VDJ, no RAG. All that's done. And we're going to be in the periphery um, where we're going to start to see responses to antigen um, in the processes that we're going to be talking about now. There are multiple types of mature B cells. 
just like there were multiple types of mature T cells. Remember, there were NK T cells and gamma delta T cells um, in addition to our classic CD8s and CD4s. Um, we are largely going to be talking about our conventional B2 B cells. Those are sort of your standard B cells. There are other B cells that act in slightly different ways, including the B1 B cells and the marginal zone B cells. Um, in a couple of places, marginal zones will show up on um, a slide. Um, and so if you see something about MZ B cells on one of the slides, that's what that means. But really, we are focusing on B2 B cells as we talk through this process. Um, so if we, so there's a little bit of a trick to all of this. Um, I am going to, as I always do, do these in a slightly different order, because um, I feel like it. Um, so again, we need to think for just a second about how we activate our B cell, just like we had to think about how we activate our T cell. Um, so you can remember that we have our B cell receptor. It had a problem in that it didn't have a very long cytoplasmic domain. Um, as a result, that B cell receptor was found with two partner proteins, Ig alpha and Ig beta, also known as CD79A and CD79B, um, that move with that B cell receptor and that have ITMs in their cytoplasmic dom uh, domain so that they can get phosphorylated. <coughs> Just like we saw CD3 doing that same job for the T cell receptor. Um, in the case of the T cell, we had our co receptors, CD4 or CD8 that were able to signal alongside of the, the original receptor and that brought in a kinase. The reason why I sort of skipped over that when we originally talked about B cells is that in reality, there are a lot of different proteins that could bring in the kinase in the case of B cells. So sometimes CD21 does that job. Sometimes CD19 does that job. Sometimes other proteins do that job. Um, so there are a lot of different potential proteins that could bring in that kinase. This uh, example shows CD21 coming in. CD21 is a complement receptor. And so you can see that the complement receptor is binding to the complement that is on the antigen and is coming closer in order to get signal. But there are lots of other ways that antigen can lead to a second signal, and we're going to see some details of that as we go forward. Once um, that signaling happens, as you might imagine, the kinase is going to phosphorylate the ITAMs. Surprise, surprise. And then we get some signaling that looks a little bit like this. If you look at that signaling, what do you notice about it? Okay, it's complicated. What else do you notice about it? Okay, birds on a single location. Anything else? It looks pretty similar to the T cell one. In fact, it's largely identical to the T cell one. Um, so you might say, no, 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 no. I never learned about anything called Lin and Fin in T cells. Yeah, they're family members of LCK. They do the same thing as LCK. Any place here where you see something that has so blink is very closely related to left. It's the exact same pathway structure, like conceptually, um, which is why I only really feel like I have to go through it once. Um, so the moral of the story is it's the same um, as what you've seen before. Um, the thing that gets a little bit tricky is that in order to fully activate a B cell, oftentimes we um, will need a T cell. So we can classify different types of um, B cell responses into either T dependent or T independent responses. And you can see two different examples of T independent um, activation on the right. Here you can see that um, in the one, this one that's shown sort of in the middle, our B cell is kind of getting a signal one and a signal two. That signal two is coming from a TLR. Um, here you can see that the B cell is just getting a really good signal one from having that kinase come into the B cell receptor. And so we can turn B cells on 
by either of these mechanisms. Either by having sort of um, some, a TLR stimulus. Oftentimes what you'll see for a, a TI2 is actually a repetitive antigen, so you'll get multiple B-cell receptors cross-linked and pulled together. But what you should notice about both of these T-independent responses is that really they don't involve class switch. So we're stuck with IgM. We don't get any of our other fancy isotypes. We don't really get affinity maturation. We don't get that nice stronger binding. We don't really get immune memory. And so yeah, we can turn B cells on and T independent responses um, do play important roles in immune responses. But if we want sort of the good classic B cell response that involves class switching, that involves affinity maturation, that involves memory responses, we need to have a T-dependent B-cell response. Our B-cell needs to interact with a T-cell in order to be activated. And that's why we didn't talk about this until we talked through the details of T-cells. And so if we really want to um, think about sort of the details of the parts of B-cell activation you are sort of used to thinking about or that people tend to think about, um, those are all part of the T-independent B-cell, or the T-dependent B-cell responses. When we have a B-cell interacting with a T-cell, that's going to give the B-cell activation that's really going to lead to proliferation. That's really going to lead towards differentiation of that cell, either into a memory cell or a specialized cell called a plasma cell, which for all intents and purposes is basically an antibody factory. The cell loses its ability to do anything other than just make antibodies. Um, that also is how we get somatic hypermutation, and that's how we get class switch. Um, those, of course, are the things that are happening later in the response um, that we are going to be seeing. So this means we've got to think for a second about our trafficking problem. We want, our goal here is to get a good, high affinity antibody against our antigen. And let's imagine that our goal is to get a good, high affinity antibody against this antigen that's also an IgG. Say you want to, I don't know, fight the rhinovirus, which is one of your major causes of the common cold, which I'm currently blaming all my life's problems on, <laughs> whether or not, I don't actually know that's what it is, but that's what I'm blaming. So let's imagine I want a high affinity IgG against rhinovirus. We've got a little bit of a trafficking issue here. How are we going to make this happen? What has to make it into a secondary lymphoid organ if we want all of this to work out? What, what you just said, right? Yeah. Like the high affinity IgG. Okay, but we want to make that. So what ingredients do we need? Yeah. Okay, so we need an antigen to get into the, the lymph node. We need a B cell. Nope, we're not recognizing. We're trying to make IgG. So like, which is a B cell. Right. So like something that will like activate IgG specifically, and not other cells. Okay. So so we need antigen. We need the B cell. We need a T cell to do T cell health. What were you gonna say? I was gonna say T cell. A T cell. Yeah. The trick is we need that T cell to make a cytokine that's gonna give us IgG switch. How does a T cell know to make that cytokine? Did what? It does specific response. It does interact. Who else does that T cell have to interact with? Yeah. Any antigen presenting cell. If you just have antigens sitting around, that's not going to do anything for the T cell. And so somehow you got to get a B cell, free antigen, a T cell, and an antigen presenting cell all together in order to make this work. Um, and so that was a slide I skipped. Um, this is why we have 
the importance of the secondary lymphoid organ here because it's the one place where all four of those things are going to get collected. We already talked about how the T cell gets there. And we also already talked about how the antigen presenting cell gets there because both of those are needed to get a good T cell response. Both of those are also needed to get a good B cell response because you can't get the good B cell response until the T cell is doing something. Which is one of the reasons why that B cell response takes a while. Happily, all of these things do come into the secondary lymphoid organ, although they tend to all end up in different places. <coughs> so you can see that the um, the T cells go to the T cell zone. The B cells are going to go to follicles, which is the B cell zone. The antigen presenting cells are going to go towards the T cell zone. Um, and the, the antigens also may be entering through um, the lymphatics. Um, and so all of these events that we already saw happening for T cells have to happen in order for us to get this good B cell response. And so again, this is why you don't make antibodies five minutes after you get infected with something. You have to have the, a T cell response activated um, in order to activate your B cell response. You can see here, as well as on the other slide, I really don't like the order of these things, um, the antigen can come in as free antigen through the lymphatics. So free virus, free uh, proteins from the virus that have been degraded may all be carried in, in the lymph. And so that starts the whole process. And that's sort of an easy part of this process, is that the antigens are going to be hanging out in the lymph node. And those antigens can bind to the B cell via its B cell receptor. And that can start to activate the B cell. Um, the B cell can become activated, as you can see here. So it's going to have increases in stuff on its surface. In particular, it's going to have an increase in MHC class 2 on its surface. It's going to start presenting on MHC class 2 much more. In a lot of ways, you can imagine this signal that the B cell is receiving through its B cell receptor as signal one for a B cell. Now, when we talked about T cells and signaling, what else was needed for those T cells? Signal two? Signal two is cytokine. And so this is kind of the signal one, but if we're really going to turn on that B cell, we kind of need to give it its signal two. And that signal two, as well as the cytokine, is what's coming from the T cell. We need to have a way for our B cell to interact with or to talk with a T cell. And that communication happens as a result of this MHC class 2 that has been induced on the surface of the B cell. So our B cell can become activated through its first signal of seeing antigen, and then it will start producing class 2 and presenting antigen on class 2. And it will be saying, hello, T cell, come help me. Come pay attention to me. Um, because of that presentation on class 2. So our CD4 T cell is going to help that B cell. This help is going to happen with interactions between proteins called CD40 and CD40 ligand. So we will have CD40 on the B cell interact with CD40 ligand on the T cell, and that will give signal 2 to the B cell to fully activate that B cell in order to do class switch, in order to do affinity maturation, and in order to differentiate into um, other types of um, 
responses. Um, that T cell will also provide some cytokines. The specific cytokine will depend on which kind of CD4 T cell we're talking about. And that will further change what happens to our B cell. The place where this gets a little bit tricky is in the location parts of this. So, on the earlier slide, when the T cell comes into the lymph node and finds the dendritic cell, finds the antigen presenting cell, that remember is presenting antigen, it's internalized it, it's chewed it up, it's put it on MHC. When the T cell does that, where in the lymph node is that? What? It's in the T cell zone. When the B cell gets its antigen and gets that signal one, where is that happening? In the B cell zone. Do you see any kind of problem here? <laughs> They're in different places, and yet they actually have to come together and touch and have this kind of interaction um, in order to make this process work. So our B cell first becomes activated. It gets its signal through the B cell receptor and becomes an activated B cell. And then the B cell moves. It moves to a different part of the lymph node. Um, it's a little bit tricky to um, describe this in some ways. Um, so officially, the activated B cell moves to a germinal center. And then if you ask me to define what is a germinal center, I would say it's the place where the activated B cell moves to. You'd be like, that's kind of circular and silly. Um, there is one other key feature of the germinal center. Um, but what you will notice is that the germinal center is this area kind of in the B cell zone, right at the border between the B cell and the T cell area, where we get this big cluster of B cells. And so um, here you can see at the uh, top, we got um, some, um, the blue is showing us B cells, the red is showing us T cells. You can see they're pretty much apart, and those are naive mice. Once we start to turn on our response, we see more active T cells. We still see the green or the antigen specific B cells there in the B cell zone. But as time goes on, we see this movement and this organization of a specialized area in the B cell zone, right near the, where the T cells were, that's called the germinal center. And the thing that happens in the germinal center is called the germinal center reaction. As I said, there's one other way that you can sort of identify a place that maybe is going to become a germinal center, or that there's one other thing that's really important that's a part of a germinal center. This is a new cell type that I'm gonna tell you about. It is the cell type that everybody hates, or everybody loves to hate, I, I don't know. It's a cell type that stands out. <laughs> um, this cell type is known as a follicular dendritic cell otherwise known as an FDC. So, right now, the most important thing that you need to know about follicular dendritic cells. Follicular dendritic cells are not dendritic cells. <laughs> yep. Once upon a time, somebody looked under a microscope and thought they looked like dendritic cells that lived in the follicle. So they called them follicular dendritic cells. And then we realized that they were nothing of the sort. So these are not dendritic cells. They do not present on MHC class two. Because they're cells, they must present on class one. But honestly, I, I never think about those in their MHC. I guess in theory, they must have MHC class one because they are completely cells. 
but I don't care about their meat. Um, but follicular dendritic cells, you can imagine, they have lots of little projections. They were thought to be dendritic cells. They have lots of parts that stick out. And those parts that stick out are covered with, oops, that's the wrong way, are covered with all sorts of different types of proteins. Follicular dendritic cells are covered with complement receptors. They're covered with FC receptors. They're covered with mannose receptors. They're covered with all sorts of different receptors. And the way you should think of a follicular dendritic cell is that they are like a style made out of tape. Everything sticks to them. If you've ever been in a situation where you see fly paper, you know that paper you like hang off the ceiling that's tape that flies just fly into and stick on to get flies out of your room or whatever? Yeah, that's what follicular dendritic cells are. They're the tape for the fly paper tape cells. They are just there to have all sorts of stuff stuck all over their surface. What that means is that when free antigen comes in through the lymphatics, it is going to get stuck all over the follicular dendritic cells. And so you can kind of think of the follicular dendritic cell as like an antigen bank. It's not internalizing that antigen. It's not presenting it. It's not processing it in any way. It's just getting it's stuck to it. Like, you can imagine, I don't know, like, toasted milk all over it or something. It's just this cell that is sitting there getting stuff stuck all over it and kind of serving as an antigen bank. Those follicular dendritic cells are the other key part of the germinal center. And so B cells will form a germinal center around a follicular dendritic cell or around a group of follicular dendritic cells. And here you can actually see this is the cell body. And these are all projections coming off of that follicular dendritic cell. So it's this big thing with all sorts of little arms that are sticky and just get stuff stuck all over it. Yeah? Why is they all in one direction? Because this is a weird picture. <laughs> I don't know why they're all in one direction. I, they're usually not. Um, and so our germinal center is going to form at that uh, follicular dendritic cell. Um, the germinal center will have two regions within it. One of those regions is called the light zone, and one of those regions is called the dark zone. Um, what you will notice is that the light zone has so the dark zone is really just these green cells, which are the B cells. Other cells, like the FDCs, are going to be these cells that we see in the light zone. You can also see the dark zone and the light zone um, through a histology image based on what they look like and why they were first called the dark zone and the light zone here. So if you look at what you see, in that picture on the right, why do you think they're called the dark zone and the light zone? Yeah, Lessie. The dark zone has a higher concentration of cells. Exactly. The dark zone has way more way more cells. The cells are way more concentrated, so it's harder for light to get through. So it's like dark. The cells are much more sparse in the light zone, and so they aren't quite as crowded. Light gets more through, so we have call them the light zone. And so in the germinal center, we see this process um, of the germinal center reaction. So our B cell, if it is activated by a T-dependent antigen, so T-dependent activation, if not, if it's one of those T-independent things, it ignores the germinal center and goes on about its happily ever after life. Um, if it sees that antigen, it will move to the germinal center. What do you think is, the, so this cell has gotten a signal that you are useful. You're the one that recognizes rhinovirus. 
Bree wants you to get more so she does not feel sick anymore. Right? So what's the first thing that that cell is going to get? What is the cell going to need? More. more of itself. That cell is going to get a pat on the head to make it survive and make it divide. Say, we need more of you. And so that cell is going to move into the germinal center and it's going to start to proliferate. And in fact, the part of the germinal center it's moving to is the dark zone. Remember, the dark zone has way more cells. The dark zone has way more cells because that's where the proliferating is happening. So you proliferate a lot, you get really, really um, sort of bunched up in the dark zone. While those cells are proliferating, those cells are also going to start making mutations. They're going to have, undergo this process where they are going to acquire mutations in their variable regions of both their heavy chains and their light chains. So we're going to turn on a mutator protein that is going to mutate randomly the BJ region of the light chain and the VEJ region of the heavy chain, adding in point mutations. Since these are body cells, um, it's called somatic. <clears throat> it's mutation, so there's mutation in the word. But it's a lot of mutation, so it's hypermutation. So we have this process of somatic hypermutation. That's what happens to the gene. And because the gene is mutated, that changes the binding site for the antigen. And the affinity for antigen changes. So we have this process of affinity maturation that occurs. So if you look at this process, where we're going to turn on a mutator enzyme, and I'll tell you more about the mutator enzyme on Friday. You turn on this mutator enzyme, um, and we're going to um, mutate the VDJ of heavy, VJ of light, improve our, and change our affinity for antigen. Can you see any possible problems with this scheme? Yeah, Nick? Yeah, it could lower just as easily as it could increase. So we're going to change the affinity. We hope it gets better. We hope the affinity matures. But we could just as easily ruin the affinity and make it so there's no binding and there's no more affinity. And this is where the germinal center reaction sort of, or how it sort of becomes important. So our cell, will, will our B cell will come in. It will interact with a T cell. It will get that signal too. And then it will start to proliferate and mutate. And imagine that you are all the progeny of one B cell, because that B cell proliferated a whole bunch. So now you are all the progeny of that one B cell. But you each turned on the mutator enzyme and made a different mutation. What's going to happen? Some of you might have awesome affinity. Some of you might have the same affinity. Some of you might have bad affinity. You are all then going to head to the follicular dendritic cell. Remember the follicular dendritic cell was super sticky and it had all the antigens stuck. And you're going to go up to the follicular dendritic cell and see if you can bind anything. Now, tell me what's gonna happen when all of you go up to that follicular dendritic cell and try to bind. You can't all do it, okay? So what's gonna happen? Only the strong. So the ones who like totally ruined their receptor can't bind at all. The ones who are the same can bind, but the ones that are really strong can bind better, and they can win, and they can compete out and crowd out the other ones. And so we have this sort of competition at the follicular dendritic cell. If the cell can get signal from the follicular dendritic cell, it lives. It proliferates again. It makes a whole bunch more copies of itself and tries this process again. If it can't get a signal from the follicular dendritic cell anymore, it dies sadly ever after. Um, and so basically, we're having sort of this um, evolution in action process that is happening 
in the uh, germinal center. And so what we see is that our B cell will get activated by antigen. It will interact with the T cell in the T cell zone, and then it will start proliferating. It proliferates first so that there are lots of copies of it so that everyone can make its own mutations. And you know, you're not gonna like lose anything. You proliferate, you go through somatic hypermutation, and then that cell tests again on the follicular dendritic cell and the T cell. The proliferation step was happening in the dark zone, really the dark zone because it's packed because that's where the proliferation happens. Then the cells move to the light zone where the FBCs are, there's no proliferation there, and there's actually a whole bunch of dying, so there's not too as many cells packed in there. If the cell does a good job, it goes back to the dark zone and proliferates and mutates again. And it goes through multiple cycles of this process until we have a very high affinity antibody um, for our antigen of interest. Um, during the time in the germinal center, our cell is also going to differentiate to potentially become either a plasma cell, which is a high um, amount of antibody producer, so it's basically an antibody factory, or a memory B cell that's going to live for a long time um, to protect you against future infections. Um, the other thing that happens in the germinal center is that class switch recombination will occur. And so we're going to get class switching of our B cell from IgM producing to one of the other isotype producing cells. Um, so these are the final results of the germinal center reaction. Our B cell is going to interact with antigen as well as helper T cells. It will undergo clonal expansion. It will also mutate so that it gets affinity maturation. It will perform isotype switching, and it will differentiate into either an antibody secreting plasma cell or a memory cell. Um, you can just remember that class switching, of course, is where we take the um, downstream constant regions and um, actually do a recombination process to remove uh, some constant regions and move the other ones closer to the VDJ region. Exactly which um, uh, isotype the B cell ends up with is based on which cytokine that B cell receives. So you can see here they show that um, if the B cell receives IL-4, it will switch to IgG1, and this is all based on sort of what's going on with that initial interaction with the T cell and the signal 3. If it gets IL-5, it will be, get make IgA, um, and so on. And so um, the cytokines that are coming from the T cell are going to determine which uh, molecule that B cell eventually makes. Um, this process is another process of recombination. So before each of the constant region um, areas where we encode each of the constant regions, there is a small thing, this is so not to scale, um, called a switch site, the little S site here. And we'll see recombination where two S sites will come together and we will cut out the intervening DNA. Here is the new transcript. Um, and move the other um, downstream constant region closer so that in this case we're getting the gamma IgG next to the VEJ um, for class switch recombination. So again, this is a change that's being made at the DNA level, just like somatic hypermutation. It was a change that was made at the DNA level. Um, and we're going to see the mechanisms of that um, on... Uh, Friday. So all of our B cells start out as IgM. One um, somewhat common um, immunodeficiency is an immunodeficiency that's known as hyper-IgM syndrome. 
So in hyper IgM syndrome, patients make, surprise, surprise, too much IgM. In reality, what's actually happening is that they're not really making too much IgM, it's that they're not making any of the other ones. So their B cells never switch. So there's no IgG, no IgA, no IgG. Um, if you look at a patient who has hyper IgM syndrome, um, and you actually look at their lymph nodes, in a normal lymph node, you can see germinal centers really easily. So you can just look with, with very little scanning, and you can see germinal centers um, in secondary lymphoid organ pretty easily. But if you look um, in a patient with hyper IgM syndrome, there are no germinal centers. And so none of this process of the germinal center reaction happens in a patient with hyper IgM syndrome. Um, there are three very famous genes that can be mutated that, and lead to hyper IgM syndrome. One of them is one I haven't told you about yet. So that one you would never guess because I haven't told you about it. But the other two I have told you about. Can you imagine what type of gene might lead to this type of immunodeficiency? Realize these patients make B cells and they make antibodies, so they get they make the B cells just fine. It's just a problem with the germinal center part and the class switch part. Um, there's probably a problem with the proliferation of the Um, so it turns out there's actually uh, there are diseases where follicular dendritic cells are a problem, but there have some slight other things going on. So there's another, another big gene that's an important gene. Is it ILK or alpha? No. <clears throat> the two, two of the three really important genes that can be mutated in hyper IgM syndrome are either CD40 or CD40 like. Um, so the T cell can never talk to the B cell, so the T cell can never say anything to the cell that was talking about. So the B cell gets activated, it would love to class switch, it would love to somatic hyper mutate, it would love to make a germinal center, but it can never get its signal to from a T cell, either because it doesn't have the receptor or because the T cell doesn't have the protein, and so we never can see um, production of a class switch or somatic hyper mutation in the patient. Yes? Does that mean they can't return to memory? Yeah. That means they don't have memory cells. Yep, that means they don't have good antibody production. Um, they really have no high level antibody production. Um, largely with those patients, a bone marrow transplant um, will be successful. Um, before bone marrow transplant, you could give those patients um, sort of antibodies that were taken from other people. You could actually just take serum from other people, purified antibodies from other people, and get it in. Um, it's called IVIG or IV immunoglobulins. And that, was what sort of kept people alive longer, um, though they did not live forever. <laughs> but um, the bone marrow transplant of um, CD40 plus or CD40 ligand plus bone marrow uh, generally is the biggest thing that helps and helps most of them. Um, so on Friday, we're going to talk about some of the specific mechanisms. What you will notice is that in the, while the B cell is in the germinal center, it has differentiation happening to it, but it also has two different changes to its DNA. The somatic hypermutation change and the class switch recombination change. And we, I sort of said, there's an enzyme. There's an enzyme. It happens. Um, in fact, when I was an undergrad, the answer was, there's an enzyme. It happens. Um, but then I think it was my first year of grad school, the enzyme got discovered. And we now know exactly how this happens. And so that's what we're going to largely be talking about on Friday. Um, I am going to tell you on Friday that somatic hypermutation and class switch happen at the same time. If you look in your textbook, it's going to say they happen at the same time. The paper that we're going to read for Monday, it says they don't happen at the same time. And that's the point of it. And that's why everyone's like, <gasps> um, So that's what's going to be in that paper that we talk about on Monday. Um, I guess what I say on Friday might not particularly agree with that, and that's because we am giving you the pre-death information. Um, so we're going to get into the mechanisms of this and finish up uh, B-cell responses on Friday.